Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Leah Rosen with NACD's research team, and I'm delighted to be moderating this Compensation Committee series webinar, Good, Bad, or Indifferent, an Objective Look at Proxy Advisors. I'm joined today by our two speakers, Reiner Golick, a director at Proto Labs, um, and also a member or chair of the Compensation Committee on six boards, and Terry Noose, who's a managing director in Pearl Myers Boston office. Today, they're going to take us through an in-depth discussion on the two big proxy advisors, ISS and Glass-Lewis, and talk through when it makes sense to follow their guidance and when it's best to go your own way. My colleague, Santa Breen, with our education team, is going to take us through a few short housekeeping items before we get started. Sienna? Thank you, Leah. Audience, as Leah said, I have a few housekeeping items to share with you today before we get started. On the right-hand side of your webinar console, you should see several boxes. At the top, you can submit a question to be answered by our speakers during the program, time permitting, and you can submit a question at any time during the webcast. If we have a lot of unanswered questions, our speakers will also follow up with you after the program. Please note that if you submit a question, you will be opted in to receive future executive compensation thought leadership from Perlmeyer. Also on the right-hand side of your console, you can tweet live with us using at NACD and at Perlmeyer. And in the bottom right corner, you can download a copy of today's slide deck, register for our next webinar, and access additional resources. You will automatically receive one NACD skill credit for participating in this webinar. Credit may be applied to NACD fellowship programs, and you can contact fellowship at nacdonline.org for more details. Please note that this is for the live program only. A recording of this webinar will be available early next week at nacdonline.org and perlmeyer.com. And finally, we will have a few anonymous evaluation questions at the very end of the program, and we would appreciate your feedback, so please stick around at the end of the webcast to answer those questions. And now I'd like to turn it back over to Leah to go over to the, the agenda. Great. So today, over the next 45 minutes or so together, we're going to cover the current landscape of compensation governance, how to decide when to follow proxy advisor's guidance, and when to forge your own path, We'll also look at engagement strategies for both proxy advisors and key shareholders. And then we'll turn to understand how private companies can gain insight from proxy advisors' guidance. And then rounding out the discussion will be future predictions for proxy advisors and the, compensa excuse me, the compensation landscape. So, Terry, let's go back to basics for a moment and answer the question of who are these proxy advisors? That's, that's great. Thanks. Thanks, Leah. And I, I do want to say thank you to Reiner and to Leah for um, co-presenting with me today. And a special thank you to Reiner because he, he actually came up with this topic, which I think is a, a super interesting one. Um, you know, we have the rise of the influence of the proxy advisors over the past decade. And for those of you that are public company directors, um, you know how often uh, this topic comes up in the boardroom. And certainly there are differing opinions, uh, both at the individual director level as well as at the company or board level on what the level of influence should be on the proxy advisor. So I think it's a great topic to explore, and I hope that the audience uh, finds it uh, informative and interesting. We, we did want to start with just a little bit of context, the primer on the proxy advisors. I think that most folks know who they are, but for those that do not, there are two big ones uh, in the U.S. They are Institutional Shareholder Services, which is often referred to as ISS, and Glass, Lewis, and Company. And um, in, in a sense, they, they're both intended to provide um, broad and deep governance solutions for investment professionals. So um, if you think about this in the context of compensation, they're developing research and recommendations, voting recommendations, uh, for public company compensation programs. And that helps their, their consumers, their customers, which is in, in effect investment professionals, to facilitate their proxy voting decisions. And these are not small companies. If you look at ISS, they have nearly 2,000 employees, and they cover 44,000 meetings a year. And Glass-Lewis is slightly smaller, but, but still um, very influential in this, in this world. So that's a primer on the proxy advisors. If we think about the sphere of their influence in terms of compensation, we bucketed it into these four areas. My, my sense is the first two are the most important. The other two are sort of emerging and growing in terms of their importance. 
So the first one being say on pay. So uh, U.S. public companies, for the most part, have to have a say on pay vote, which is a non-binding advisory vote on the company's compensation policies. And the proxy advisors will look at those uh, compensation programs, will look to look at the design and structure of the program, the decisions that are being made, and take a look at broader pay and performance alignment. And they'll use that uh, to, to determine a vote recommendation for their customers. Equity plan request, so this is a, a company asking shareholders to authorize additional shares or to modify the existing share plan that's been approved by shareholders. Uh, the proxy advisors will, will take a look at this and they'll assess it for reasonableness and provide a vote recommendation. And so um, they can be very influential in this area as well. The, the other two areas are, I would say, are less influential because they're not directly impacting vote recommendations, particularly as it relates to the compensation governance scores. And on director compensation, this is a new and emerging area. So ISS is the only one at this point that's looking into this, but they're going to start evaluating director compensation primarily around the, the magnitude, the size of director pay, and, um, and targeting companies that, that, that pay in the upper 2 to 3 percentage points and don't have a compelling rationale for being an outlier. And to the extent that they find that, they may vote against or recommend an against vote uh, on director elections. So there are some important um, pieces in terms of their sphere of influence in the compensation realm. We did want to show a little bit of data on say on pay. When I looked at this chart, the, the theme to me was that um, over, investors overwhelmingly support the U.S. executive pay model and pay programs. If you look at the last 10 years of data on say on pay, you can see that the average uh, vote support was uh, in the, roughly in the low 90s. And so that means that uh, nine out of every sh 10 shares that are being voted on are being voted for as it relates to say on pay. And not only do you generally have high support in the low 90s, you also have few companies that actually fail say on pay. And you can see that at the bottom of the page. So generally speaking, one to 2% of companies each year will receive less than 50% vote support on their say on pay uh, proposal. So in, in looking at the impact of proxy advisors, we can understand what their influence levels are. So this chart is focused on ISS. And what it shows is, again, over the same 10-year period of time for say on pay, what was the vote support for companies that received a four-vote recommendation from ISS? So ISS was supporting their, their say on pay proposal versus an against vote recommendation. So the four vote recommendation is the blue bars and the against vote recommendation is the gray bars. And you can see that level of influence. So if you just look at 2018, the most recent year, 95% support for companies receiving a four vote recommendation from ISS versus 66% for those receiving against. So nearly 30 percentage points difference uh, between the two. So their influence is significant. Again, we wanted to look at the say on pay, um, and in particular, how many companies have received an against vote recommendation uh, fr from ISS over time. And we looked at this on a cumulative basis. So this is the Russell 3000, and it's starting in 2009 all the way until the end of 2018. How many companies have received at least one against vote recommendation since 2009? And you can see that we're almost to the point of inflection where it's almost a majority of companies have received an, one against vote recommendation. Terry, this is, this is Ryan, maybe to add something. What I thought was interesting about this slide, particularly if you look at this slide two, two slides ago where it suggested that uh, most people are supporting companies on the same pay votes, is that uh, really here you've got about a 4 to 5% addition uh, to the club every year. So 4 to 5 new companies are added to the club of those who've gotten against recommendation. And when we look at votes in the next slide, we'll see a similar statistic. So I thought as a, as a, certainly as a comp committee chair, that's actually fairly sobering uh, statistic. So it, it does suggest that many of us are going to be in a situation where we do have to manage something like this. And so kind of one observation. The second I might also make here is that one of the challenges I think uh, may be maybe seen here is that uh, you know, obviously uh, ISS is very focused on things like uh, making sure that paid performance are aligned. And 
you know, one of the challenges that we have as comp committees is that we typically decide on the executive pay for a given year at the beginning of the year, and we also make grants uh, of equity at the beginning of the year based on, you know, Black-Scholes formulas. And then if you have a bad year that year, uh, uh, then uh, the, pay, say, the kind of equity, the alignment of pay can look bad, right? Because A, ISS typically does not look at realized pay. They often typically just look at the, what the black shoals value tells you. And so that the uh, lower realized pay that comes from bad performance isn't reflected in it, uh, number one. And number two, you could have given them big uh, pay performance increase uh, at the beginning of the year based on a great year the year before, which then doesn't manifest itself in that actual year. So there's a little bit of timing I think that a lot of comp committees face that that may be one of the drivers here uh, for some of these um, against recommendations. Yeah, it, it's absolutely true. Not only that, you also have um, the, the timing disconnect. It is, it's different for the equity than it is for the bonus, and so you have the equity being granted in one year and not disclosed until the next year, whereas the bonus is awarded in a year and it's disclosed in that year. So you can have some real um, apples and oranges. And the other thing is that it's just it's it's very hard to be a sustained outperformer in the public markets. And the way that these models work is half the equation is how has your performance been on a relative to basis. And so you might find that a company could be a, a, an outperformer in eight out of 10 years, but they fall into a trap in one or two out of those years. So their models do create some challenges with companies. So just moving along, we did look at, so the last slide was really focused on ISS and um, their against vote recommendations. Um, we don't have the same data set for Glass-Lewis, but we did just say, well, if a, if a company received less than 85% support, on their say on pay vote, that could be indicative that either Glass-Lewis or ISS had recommended an against vote. And when you look at those statistics, we do almost get to that 50% point in 2018. And to Reiner's point, it's also very consistent. So you're adding uh, generally four to five percentage points each year, and it doesn't seem to be any slowing down um, uh, of the curve. So one of the things that their rise in influence has led to is what we call this notion of a conformity trap. Um, and so what this is is that ISS and Glass-Lewis have stated policies on what they view to be good practice, good governance versus bad practice, bad governance, and, and companies um, will make changes in an effort to be more aligned with the, uh, the policies of the proxy advisors. And in some of these, these are in some of these cases, these are um, these are very good changes to make. But they do create a, a notion of conformity amongst uh, public companies. And so some of the areas that you see a lot of conformity are around uh, peer group development. So companies tend to use the same criteria to develop peer groups uh, or pay levels. We've we've researched this, and over time we've seen that there's been a narrowing in terms of the competitive ranges of pay, with a regression towards the median. So companies are less likely to be an outlier on the high end and on the low end, and the, the ranges of pay have narrowed significantly. And then we've also seen some, some structural elements uh, change over time. So the elimination of perquisites. Um, companies have uh, very similar contractual provisions now. Most companies use double trigger on equity as opposed to single trigger. Uh, and then the whole incentive plan design uh, area. So this would be the, the metric groupings, uh, the leverage in incentive plans. There tends to be a lot of commonality amongst companies now in these areas. There, there are a couple of areas, notably, that, that there is still some difference. And you do tend to see quite a bit of variation in terms of long-term incentive mix. There has been a rise in, in performance-based equity over time. But if you think about the three different main instruments being stock options, restricted stock, or restricted stock units, and performance-based equity, there generally is a, a pretty healthy um, level of differentiation in terms of mix across companies. Yeah, one thing, again, I would add as a, as a comp committee chair and, and, and board member, I think some of the areas of conformity are actually really quite good, right? I mean, there's really no reason not to have a double trigger. That is, is good governance. And I think uh, ISS and Glass-Lewis can, I think, be perhaps thanked to help push people into good governance this area. But I think other areas where they have pushed or tried to push conformity, I'm less enthusiastic. I mean, for many years, they were really pushing hard in relative TSR as a particular measure, which, you know, in some companies, may make a lot of sense, but a lot of companies, I believe, does not. And, and right now, they actually seem to be moving away from that. So I think 
there are many areas of conformity which it's really good in. Others I, I'm you know, more skeptical, and I think as we get into this discussion, we'll talk about a little bit about how companies can decide where they follow the conformity, where they uh, buck the trend, so to speak. Yep. Okay, great. So with that, I think we have our first poll question, so I'm going to flip it over to Leah. Yeah, great. Thanks, Terry. So um, as you mentioned, we have our first poll question. So the question is, in your experience, which of the following areas are proxy advisors' decisions most influential? So we'll ask uh, our virtual attendees to choose one response. And so the options are stay on pay, equity plans, director compensation, none of the above, or don't know, unsure. Terry, which of these do you expect to be the most influential topic? Well, I, I, I certainly think it sh it's going to be one of the first two. My guess would be it'll be the first one, say, on pay. But um, some companies that have, have had particular challenges with their equity plans could actually go with, um, with equity plans. So I think it'll likely be, um, say, on pay, followed shortly by equity plans. But we'll have to see. All right. Let's see what the results say. All right, it looks like an, a resounding say on pay um, with 54% of our virtual attendees citing say on pay and then 17% on equity plans. Yeah, that's about what I thought. I thought equity plans might be a little higher, but I thought say on pay would would carry the day. Director, it's, It'll be interesting if we look at this in five years how the director compensation will have changed as well because my sense is that ISS has now gotten into this business. They will have more complex evaluation tools over time, much like they have had on the executive compensation side, and we may see Glass Lewis get into this area as well. So director compensation could be one that could increase in terms of its influence over time. Okay, great. So I thought that provided some good context in terms of the, the proxy advisors, their level of influence, and some data around historically what we've seen in terms of trends. So now we're going to flip to more of the diagnostic section. So for your particular company, how should you think about evaluating the level of proxy advisory influence? And um, the way we thought about it was there's sort of two buckets. One is um, from an internal perspective and one is from an external perspective. And we're going to go into some of the specifics on a couple of these. But I will just say, um, take for instance on the internal perspective, which is the left-hand side, a company's profile can actually have a very um, big influence in terms of how, how influential the proxy advisors can be. So just think about a company that's a, uh, a micro-cap company that has uh, largely a retail shareholder base. Uh, it's not likely that ISS is going to be that influential for that company, whereas if you are a large um, S&P 500 company with a largely institutional shareholder base, they, they may carry more weight. So company profile is certainly an important one. Another one on the internal side that I would um, call out would be performance. Companies that generally have good performance gen can test better in their models, and so they may have a path of easier resistance than a company that's been a uh, performance laggard over time. On the external side, we kind of covered on the shareholder profile. That's if you're largely institutional-based versus if you have a retail base of shareholders. Um, the other important piece on this would be um, whether or not the, the proxy advisors believe the topic that you're talking about is a hot-button topic, and we'll, we'll get into the details around what some of those hot buttons are. So one of the ways that we like to think about this, and this would be the drivers behind compensation design and um, decisions. And this schematic basically shows uh, an optimal arrangement. So this would be working left to right, understanding the key drivers uh, for the business, what's the business strategy, what's the leadership strategy, and how do those things then translate themselves into a compensation philosophy and strategy, uh, as well as program design, and then ultimately decisions and communication. And you can see those circular um, areas at the bottom. Those are areas that should inform the process, but not necessarily drive the process. So that would be things like market data, um, and as well as external perspectives and optics. The external perspectives and optics is where I would house the proxy advisory firms. So they are an important piece. They help inform the discussion. They help inform the decisions, but they don't necessarily drive things. So I think this is in a perfect world how companies could think about it. Obviously, there are factors that could change the way that um, the, the level of influence of the proxy advisory firms. 
And in this scenario, I, I would uh, choose to emphasize that I've been in enough committee meetings where people have almost blindly wanted to follow what uh, ISS or Glass-Lewis is saying and almost uh, elevated them to the form of a driver rather than an influencer. And I can't stress enough how important it is to have the business strategy and leadership strategy ultimately be the driver. And if, if it's consistent with those two, I think it's almost always okay to ignore uh, Glass-Lewis and ISS. You have to communicate effectively, but, but those two things have to be the driver. Right, right. And the other piece that we'll get into, Reiner, is really around having direct shareholder engagement because that can uh, reduce the level of influence that, that the proxy advisors have if shareholders understand the story and they buy into the story and, and the decisions that you're trying to make. Okay, next is really around topic importance. So we, we put together this little diagnostic tool, and it really has two axes. One is the, the importance of the topic to the company, and the second is the importance to the, of the topic to the proxy advisory firms. So if you think about on, on the proxy advisory firm axis, um, a, an area of high importance to them in terms of um, uh, something that they would not advise doing would be like an excise tax gross-up, right? And so um, uh, you can think about things through these vectors, high and low on proxy advisory firm importance and high and low on company performance. And generally speaking, if it's high on the company's list in terms of importance and low in terms of the proxy advisory firm importance, that'd be something where you'd go with the company um, and you'd di diverge from proxy advisory firm policy. Same with low and low. I think um, if it's a h of high importance to the proxy advisory firms and low importance to the company, there you're more likely to be in line uh, with how the, the proxy advisory firms' um, uh, policies go. And then the, the difficult one is I think if it's high importance to the proxy advisory firm and high importance to the company, then I think you have to default to other factors. Okay, so a list of hot button issues. Um, this is not a complete list, it's not comprehensive, but we did want to give the audience a sense of some of the things that the proxy advisors would suggest uh, avoiding and uh, certainly things that we want to be careful about. So on the generally avoid side, I did mention excise tax gross ups. There's a thing called an evergreen share replenishment, so that's um, providing an automatic replenishment to your share pool every year. Uh, it, and that's embedded in your equity plan. They generally would um, not recommend uh, for your equity plan if you had that provision in place. Certainly things like excessive severance and excessive perquisites are going to be irritants to them as well as uh, to many shareholders, so look to avoid those. Anything that's an incentive vehicle that you are guaranteeing to an individual, so a guaranteed bonus for multiple years. Sometimes those things try to be negotiated in when you're hiring an individual, so you want to avoid those. Um, and then the, the last one I think is particularly important. To the extent that you do have a poor say-on-pay vote outcome, you need to uh, engage with shareholders and disclose that outreach and engagement process. To the extent you don't do that, the, the proxy advisory firms will be critical of the company. On the be careful side, there are a few here that I think um, maybe won't, wouldn't be considered excessive for the proxy advisors, but things to be careful about, like targeting above the median. Um, they believe that can create a ratcheting effect to pay, so many companies have defaulted to targeting median um, pay for, for pay targets, um, as well as things like uh, discretionary payments. And I know, Reiner, you've, you've had some experience with a couple of these, right, in a couple of your um, uh, compensation committees. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I would agree with the generally avoid area as well. And, and generally we, where we've had some things, like I've been on uh, two comp committees where we had evergreen provisions and we changed those, uh, although we did make sure that we have enough in the pool uh, for what we needed to do. Uh, but I'm to be careful. It's an area where, you know, I've been fairly liberal about doing what the right thing. Uh, I'll, I'll give two examples above median uh, uh, compensation. You know, I've done that a couple times, but in each case, you know, really targeted with some above median performance targets. And so that above median compensation would only be hit if, if some really stellar performance was delivered. And so I think those are all cases where the shareholders would be would be quite happy if if we do deliver. Uh, again, you need to have very good communication when you do that. But we felt for the business strategy. That made a lot of uh, sense. Another one is uh, duplicate metrics and incentives plan, incentive plans. At, at some level, it seems like a very logical thing that you don't want to uh, pay for the same thing in the short-term and the long-term incentives. But if you think about it, take a simple one like um, 
growth, right? The set of things that management would do to achieve growth in this calendar year are generally going to be different than the set of incentives that management would take to achieve growth, you know, three years out, which is what is important for the long-term incentives. And in fact, uh, the growth that you want to have three years out could conflict with a short-term incentive around uh, profitability. And so I think there are going to be a lot of situations like that where the company's strategy would uh, indicate that you do stuff that ISS or Glass-Lewis ultimately does not like. And, and in those cases, I think it's always best to go with, with a strategy uh, that, is, you know, that is good for the company. You've got to communicate it and, and in the CDNA be very clear what you're doing. But even there, sometimes the, I find they don't read the CDNA very carefully and they'll still ding you. But it's, it's better to get a one notch lower on your score, I think, than to do something that isn't right for the business. So on the be careful side, I, I, I often find situations where it makes sense to do something different than what, uh, what they're saying. Yeah. And and the lists do evolve over time as well. So that's another important point. Like if you looked at five years ago, the whole notion of duplicate measures and incentive plans may have been more in the generally avoid. There was much more focus on it. And I think that um, uh, the level of criticism that companies receive, if they have that, has waned over time. Because I think there's some recognition that as long as you're evaluating, it may be the same measure, but as long as you're evaluating over uh, different performance periods, then there's adequate differentiation there. But so the, so these lists will evolve over time. This is another important um, diagnostic tool that I think companies could benefit from. So this is around understanding um, the level of overlap between your uh, investor base, your shareholders, and how they vote um, in lockstep or or not in lockstep with ISS and Glass Lewis. And so we now have this data. Um, this data is from Proxy Insight, but you have access to this type of information. And so um, just by way of example, this is a sample, but if you just looked at Wellington Management on the first row, you can see that when ISS, uh, the second to last column, when ISS recommends against on say on pay, um, uh, Wellington Management, 30% uh, of the time, also recommends against or will, will actually vote the shares against on say and pay. And so not a ton of overlap for a company like Wellington. If you look like at a Bank New York Mellon, which is the fifth company down, there's a significant amount of overlap. So almost 90% of the time when ISS recommends an against vote, Bank New York Mellon votes the shares against. And you can run this for your specific company to really understand what that level of overlap is. And this is an area where I would really urge people to take a very close look. Uh, in particular, a lot of the, uh, as everyone knows, more and more money is going into the passive investment uh, uh, funds and vehicles, um, you know, like BlackRock and, 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 and so. And those firms are all developing a very robust governance practice of their own uh, that uh, has its own views and perspectives on things. And as you can see from the numbers here, uh, don't really have a perfect overlap uh, in their voting record with ISS and Glass-Lewis. And so we'll get a little bit later on in the discussion to how we might engage with those folks, but I think it's super important for people to see this. And the macro trend, of course, is towards these big holding companies. And the reason that they have uh, every investment in developing their own proxy voting um, uh, perspectives is that in many ways, you know, if you think about it as an investor, you have two ways in which you can influence events. One is you can choose not to own the shares, and the second is you can use your voting power to influence what the company does. And obviously, all the passive investors can't make the first choice, right? They, they, they have to stay in the shares. They, they have no choice. And so as a result, the one thing they can do and want to do is make sure that uh, their governance engagement is such that it leads to long-term uh, strong performance. And, and so I think more and more companies will see a much higher percentage of their shareholders with that perspective. And as we'll talk a little later on about how to engage those folks. Yeah. That's a great point, Reiner. The other thing I'd mention on this slide is that um, many companies, uh, ISS is the larger of the two um, proxy advisors, um, and many companies will just default to thinking that they're the most influential uh, or the more influential of the two, uh, but it's not always the case. You could have a particular set of investors that tend to vote more in lockstep with Glass-Lewis, and so um, this is another way to understand um, what the level of influence is across the two firms. Another good diagnostic tool um, you can see on this page, which is understanding for your investor base, which is the, the, yellow, uh, the yellow cells there, 
um, what are their um, specific voting policies because many of these firms have their own voting policies that they look at as well. So what are their um, um, hot button issues or specific voting policies relative to that of an ISS or a Glass-Lewis and to map those out across each other to understand if there are going to be any real uh, pain points uh, around a particular topic. So I think this is a good exercise to have um, the company go through to really understand um, where those levels of overlap are. And then, and then the spectrum of attention. So obviously this is not a black or white issue. Uh, there, are, um, there are a lot of points around this line. On one end of the spectrum, um, you have um, areas or uh, circumstances where you likely can ignore the proxy advisors. On the under, other end of the spectrum, um, you have uh, characteristics or circumstances where you likely cannot ignore them, and there's all, um, perme all types of permutations in between. Um, but you do have to look at it through the lens of your own particular facts and circumstances. And so you can see on the left-hand side of the slide there, if you have a, a company um, that, uh, that has um, an investor base that largely votes with the proxy advisors, they're going to have a lot more influence and it's likely that you can't ignore them. Similar, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a company that's had uh, been a, a chronic underperformer, it's likely that um, either the proxy advisors or activists are going to get in and so you cannot, in, uh, uh, you cannot ignore uh, their policies. Or if you had issues with, say, on pay, that's another one. Um, whereas companies on the right-hand side of the spectrum, if you have uh, a shareholder base that tends to vote independent and you have sh good relationships with your shareholders and you have active uh, and ongoing dialogue with them, it's likely that um, the influence of ISS and, and Glass-Lewis is less, and so you may be able to ignore them on certain, certain topics. But it is a spectrum, and it does differ by the topic that you're talking about. Okay, so with that, I think I'm going to flip it over to Leah for uh, another poll question. Great. So our next polling question is looking at how frequently does your company engage on compensation issues with proxy advisors, so compensation-specific issues. So you can choose one of either frequently, meaning more than once per year, at times, one time a year or every other year, the next option is not at all or not applicable, meaning you don't engage with proxy advisors on compensation-related issues. And Terry, which bucket do you think most of your clients would fall into? Yeah, well, if we're, if we're talking about real engagement with the proxy advisors, which is like setting up a specific meeting to talk about specific topics, I, my guess would be not at all. Um, um, but you may have some companies that have other types of interaction with them, and they may choose to use that times or frequently. So I'm going to guess not at all, but I could be wrong on this one. Well, let's take a look. And it looks like uh, you're, you're almost right with 32%, almost 33% and not at all, uh, and then closer to 40% at times, meaning either one time a year or every other year. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I could see the more episodic um, interaction with ISS. You have a particular issue that you want to make sure they understand or get a um, uh, get clarity around uh, a particular uh, policy topic. So you could see that. Um, but I'm not surprised at the 33% not at all. I think this is also an area where you're seeing um, companies do more of this now than they have historically. And so I would expect the, um, the at times are frequently to actually go up over time. So we did want to talk a little bit about proxy advisor engagement. And uh, so as most folks uh, likely know, um, both ISS and Glass-Lewis have engagement protocols. So they have specific um, uh, sets of um, ways that you go about engaging with them. I do think it can be a helpful exercise to engage with them, uh, particularly if you want to hear um, what their policy details are and any context around their policy details straight from them as opposed to, um, you know, through uh, another third-party vendor. Um, I think it also gives you the opportunity to communicate the rationale for your program, particularly if there's something that's off-market or something that doesn't fall in line with their policy views. And it can also help to avoid uh, misunderstandings. I think that's an important one. As far as tips for engagement, I, I would plan ahead. I would go through the proper engagement protocols. Um, they don't always take the meetings that you request. And so um, 
And so I would go about going through the process with the, with the realization and the recognition that you may not actually get uh, FaceTime with them. Um, I would also recognize that having the discussion doesn't replace the need to disclose um, the program, the decision, the, the, um, uh, uh, the structure of the program, whatever it may be. Uh, you still have to go through that disclosure process uh, in addition to the discussions. And then also to recognize that if you have a positive meeting with them, it doesn't necessarily mean a positive vote recommendation from them. They can differ. And, um, and I would keep it to the, the important pieces, the things that you want to convey. So those are just a few, a few tips for engagement. And as most folks also know, uh, there are certain um, topics and certain circumstances that you may want to purchase their subscriptions. So they have, a, like, take the equity plan. If you're going for a new share authorization, they have a model that um, will give you the answers as to what they deem is acceptable. And so many companies will purchase those subscriptions, and that gives companies access to their tools and their, their advisors. Yeah, maybe just a couple comments here. The way I've always thought about it is it's kind of there's almost three levels of engagement, right? The, the least of which is, you know, clarifications, right? If they come out with their uh, assessment of your program, uh, you know, um, you know, often uh, they they didn't read carefully enough, and you can go in and clarify things. I think that's kind of that's that one level that I'm sure many people have had, and that's probably why the occasional was was uh, high on the previous polling question. I think the second one is is of course their subscriptions, and I think these will you know, it's a little bit fraught to some degree to use their subscriptions. You never, they, they say they keep the two houses of, of their consulting and their proxy uh, advisory very separate, you know, but who knows. Uh, it, they, but as they do more analytics around things like uh, the uh, evaluating uh, pay for performance, you know, understanding their models and making sure you can uh, understand what they're saying and recreate them at least so that you know how they're going to view you, I think may create a bit of a push to doing some of their subscriptions so you can get some a access to their tools if you feel that uh, that you don't understand well enough how they're doing all their calculations. Uh, so I think that that's the second. And the third, of course, is really engaging with them uh, proactively in terms of the proxy itself, which is where Terry said they have the engagement tools. And there, the one advice I would give is, is, is if, if you think that's important or you do some things that are uh, you know, a little more unusual, uh, do it early, do it before you have an issue, right? Often we think it's very important to engage these folks when there's things like activists involved, for example. And then if, if you just come when there's a fire, it's, it's a lot less credible than if, if there's been some sustained engagement. So to the degree that there are people interested in that engagement, I would suggest doing it when things are good uh, rather than waiting until things are bad. Yeah, good good points, Ryan. So I, I think with that, we're going to shift over to another poll question, which is around um, engagement with actual shareholders. Yes, exactly, Terry. So the same question, but looking at it from a slightly different lens um, with the focus on shareholders. So how frequently does your company engage on compensation-specific issues with shareholders? So again, frequently, meaning more than one time per year, at times, either once a year or every other year, not at all, or not applicable, meaning you do not engage with shareholders on compensation-related issues. And then, Terry, the same question, what would you say for your clients? How often are they reaching out to their shareholder base to discuss compensation? Well, yeah, my guess would be it's far more frequent than the than you would see with the proxy advisors. I guess the question will be, is it going to be frequently or is it going to be at times? I'm going to go with frequently, but I wouldn't be surprised if at times was the most uh, prevalent. All right. Let's go ahead and see what the results say. At times. Wow. 44% at yeah. times. You got it right. Yeah, well, and so frequently is actually very low at 15%, which is surprising. And maybe it's the distinction between one, more than one time a year. So uh, you, we will have many companies that will do it once a year. Um, but, but you may start to see that creep up as well. You may start to see companies going out more than once a year just in the, in the spirit of ongoing dialogue around these topics. So that's interesting. What about the, per the percentage of, of folks on the line that said not at all? Is that surprising? Yeah, it's a bit surprising. It could be reflecting the profile of the directors on the call. So if you have private um, company directors, 
Um, they may not be engaging in the way that public company directors would. Uh, and it can also be around the question. So the directors themselves may not be participating in those engagement efforts, but the company may be doing them. So it could be just some nuances in the question. Okay, so similar to the proxy advisory uh, firm engagement, uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about actual shareholder engagement. So just some key points here. I would say up front you want to define the outreach team and their associated roles, so figure out who the task team is and what they're going to be doing. Generally speaking, it's a combination of HR, legal, investor relations, finance. Uh, in some cases, the board will be participating in those discussions and um, in a limited set of circumstances, external advisors. External advisors can be helpful in the background, but my experience is that they're generally not um, active participants in the actual outreach calls. Second would be define the scope of the outreach. Are you, are you making it a general type outreach? Is it going to be around a specific topic or set of topics? Is it going to be just compensation? Is it going to be uh, more governance related uh, around compensation? And then who, who you want to out, actually outreach to. So what are the, uh, the, the parameters that you want to use in terms of defining the shareholders that you'll outreach to? Is it your top 10, your top 20? Um, is it based upon active versus passive, those sorts of things. So defining the team and the scope I think is great. And then, um, and then this, the third bullet is around really understanding um, the voting guidelines. So we talked a lot about the ISS and Glass-Lewis uh, voting guidelines, um, but obviously a lot of these institutional investors have their own uh, voting guidelines. And so before you get on any calls with them, you want to understand what their key points are and what their pain points may be. And it's very common to develop a set of materials to so serve as a conversation starter. You send that out in advance, and then um, you may use it, you may not use it, but at a minimum it gives, um, it gives the shareholders, the, the governance folks that you're going to be speaking to, a sense of the company and um, what you want to actually accomplish on the call. I would keep it to publicly available information uh, to avoid any uh, disclosure of non, not material non-public information. And then if you go through all these efforts and you're a public company, you definitely want to disclose the outreach and engagement um, uh, results in your next proxy statement. I think that's a super helpful thing to do in terms of showing responsiveness and showing engagement with your shareholders. Yeah, here's an area where, Terry, I actually have a pretty strong perspective. I feel a lot of companies, also public companies, aren't, aren't doing enough. Again, I, we talked earlier about how uh, a lot of the folks who are representing passive investors are becoming a much, much larger per, uh, percentage of the, the uh, shareholders uh, in, in many companies, and these companies are developing their own perspective. And as we talked about, th these companies don't have the choice to vote with their feet. And so they, the way they think about these things is that they, they as a company like BlackRock, again, I'll take it as the example, uh, they don't know what the company's strategy should be. They don't think they have the expertise to know what your strategy should be. So they think about what kinds of things can we do as BlackRock or um, you know, any of the other firms, uh, you know, Fidelity, to ensure that the companies that we have to invest in uh, deliver long-term shareholder returns. And so the way they really think about this is, do you have good governance? Uh, and if you have good governance, uh, their belief is ultimately uh, you will deliver uh, or have a higher probability, uh, probability of delivering good shareholder returns. And, and here, it's important also to note that engaging with them when there's a fire drill and there's an activist or something like that or the stock really tanks or something, that's often too late. And um, generally, these firms like to, be, uh, like to have engagement. They don't necessarily need to hear from you every year, but the notion of kind of having a sustained program to engage with these folks uh, every, say, two years or so, update them on the company, uh, the strategy, but more importantly on the governance approaches, uh, that could pay a lot of dividends, particularly if there's ever a speed bump. Uh, if, they, if they're on your side and believe you're approaching these things effectively and well, uh, it can really pay a lot of dividends. So it's an area I would really urge uh, folks to take a look at. In terms of kind of who leads that, obviously management needs to be uh, very much involved, but uh, to the degree that the directors are involved, interestingly here, it's probably less often the comp chair, but nom and gov, uh, because often uh, the uh, uh, firms here are more interested in overall governance and this governance in good shape than they are very specifically comp. Comp is just one part of their overall governance. And so often uh, the NAMA Gov Chair actually 
is the board representative uh, in, in those discussions. But it's an area I really would urge people to take a very close look at uh, doing something about. Okay, so I want to just touch a bit on um, the private companies. So we obviously have a lot of directors uh, in the audience today that um, also are directors of private companies. And while the topic is largely oriented towards public company directors, I think just um, conceptually having an understanding of ISS and Glass-Lewis's policies and how well your private company's policies align with those um, those voting policies, I think is a, is a beneficial exercise to go through. It, it may be that your company's private now, but they may not be private at some point in the future, so um, the proxy advisors may become an influential body at some point. And I think it's just in, in the spirit of um, good governance and, and good oversight, I think it's important to uh, kind of understand their policies and understand how you would um, stack up relative to them. I, I agree, and it's, it's it, you know a lot of the ideas that they have are very good, and and there's absolutely no reason public or private companies shouldn't follow them. And obviously, to the degree that anyone's uh, thinking of going public, it's it's good to show a history of being consistent with those policies. Right. So we did want to just do a, a quick crystal ball, um, and then leave some time for Q and A. Uh, so just in terms of what we expect to happen in the future, I think um, not surprisingly, um, groups like ISS and Glass-Lewis are going to continue to try to expand their sphere of influence. We saw it uh, with director compensation in ISS in the most recent year to two years, and I would expect that they'll continue to do that, find new areas where they can be uh, valuable to their, to their customers um, in evaluating companies. Um, with that expanding influence, um, you, you'll likely to see some sort of SEC oversight. Um, they've talked about this for a long time and nothing's been put in play yet, but to the extent that their influence continues to, um, to go up at the same trajectory it has, um, the SEC may have to step in at some point. And, and what that would lead to is um, from my perspective, would be uh, more complex voting policies, but more transparency around the voting policies and less discretion on the analysts that are making vote recommendations. Uh, so they would be more quantitative. And then, uh, and then lastly, more time for companies to review the reports to make sure that they are factu factually accurate. Uh, right now, companies, some, a select number of companies receive a short window of time to review draft reports, and um, that, that window of time could, could expand. I think institutional investors, Reiner's made this point a couple of times, institutional investors are also going to increase the complexity of their, of their policies as well. Um, but I do still, I think this notion of conformity, uh, you're going to see companies continue to inch towards um, proxy advisor policies over time, and, and the proxy advisor policies will obviously evolve over time as well. What will be interesting to see is if the U.S. ever tries to adopt some sort of European governance model. Like in Europe, they have binding say on pay in uh, some countries, and so um, I could sense that being evaluated. I don't know if it will come to fruition here, but uh, at a minimum, that will be looked at. So with that, I think we wanted to do some Q&A. Yes, um, so we have about 10 minutes to take some questions from the audience. And just a reminder for those on the line, we will likely not be able to get through all of the questions that you've submitted today, um, but we are collecting them, and Perlmeyer has promised to respond to your questions via email. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, jump right into the first one. Um, so the first question is around uh, shareholder outreach. So what percentage of the say on pay vote results do you consider to be negative and want to start reaching out to shareholders about um, your negative stay on pay? At what percentage? Is it 90? Is it 80? What do you think, Terry? Yeah, so it, it could differ by um, how you want to think about it. From my perspective, I would say 85% would be a good line of demarcation um, where you want to do some active shareholder outreach. The expectation is that you're going to be in the 90% range. You may have a, a shareholder or two who, who um, vote against but you should be in that 90% range on average. The proxy advisors actually have a lower threshold. Um, I believe Glass-Lewis is 80%, and ISS is either 70 or 80%. And so they would say that if your vote level uh, dips below that, that line, um, then you certainly would need to show some responsiveness through shareholder outreach and perhaps through changes to your programs in the next year. Uh, 
the other right. comment one can make is obviously you can, as soon as you can tell, obviously who voted one way or the other, and if it's a big block of shares that voted against you, then obviously you know who you need to reach out to. So there's some analytics you can do to see if it's a broad-based uh, dissatisfaction or something that's very specific to one or two shareholders who didn't like some aspect of the plan or approach. Great. Our next question is, what issues or concerns do proxy advisors have with stock options? Whether they're qualified yeah. or qualified? Well, I would say two things. One is they don't consider them to be performance-based, and um, particularly in the case of ISS. And, um, and so their, um, their models will penalize companies that use stock options. So... Um, but both proxy advisors believe that a majority of long-term incentive compensation should be delivered through performance-based um, equity or performance-based long-term incentives. And so to the extent that you use stock options and they don't deem them to be performance-based, whereas many people believe they are performance-based, I'm actually a believer that they are performance-based, but um, uh, then you can run into issues. And so it's, the, it's this, um, this notion that they don't believe they're performance-based as well as um, they, they ascribe a higher value to an option award than the company does for accounting or disclosure purposes. So that's that penalty that you get to the extent that you use them. Great. And then, Reiner, this question is for you. Um, is one of the firms more impactful than the other when it comes to ISS and Glass-Lewis? It seems that ISS gets more focus uh, on the board of this uh, question asker. Yeah, I, I would say that ISS has a bit more kind of broad cachet with folks and people listen to it a bit more. Um, and, and I would imagine if, if we did, uh, if we had the data that, that Terry said he approximated, uh, we'd find they have a bit more influence. Um, generally, they're not going to be that different in their, their assessments. So if you do one well with one, you'll do well with the other. But, but that, that would be my, my vote is on ISS. Great. And then um, this one's uh, probably for Terry, but I would love to hear both of your perspectives. How large of a correlation are you seeing between adverse say on pay recommendations and votes um, and then changes in the voting recommendation methodologies from ISS or Glass-Lewis? Um, so just repeat that one more time. I just want to make sure I understand the question. Yeah, absolutely. So how large of a correlation are you seeing between uh, a negative say on pay vote and then the voting recommendation methodologies that ISS and Glass-Lewis are using? Oh, well, I'd so say it's a pretty high correlation. I just want to show this. Is the idea that if, if – so are the companies changing their policy or is ISS changing the policy? You mean the company changing the policy? Just to make sure I understand the question. I believe it's ISS changing the policy. Well, I, I think I think there's high correlation between ISS's policies and their vote recommendations. So um, there is some level of um, qualitative assessment in their in their vote recommendations, but it largely tracks with their voting policies. I, I I don't know about whether or not they change. They do obviously change their voting policies over time, but I don't think it's a reaction to negative vote recommendations. And then uh, I think one of our final questions is looking at the use of gap performance metrics. Is that a do or a don't? Mm, it's a good question. I'd say from a prevalence standpoint, a vast majority of companies use non-gap. And so they would, um, they would do that in the spirit of core operating performance. But there are, um, there are companies that will use gap. And I think uh, non-gap is getting a little bit more um, spot of a spotlight on it. And so um, there, there's been some uh, effort to try to put um, disclosure of the, of the um, reconciliation of non-GAAP to GAAP for incentive purposes into the proxy statement. So that's something that we may see come down the pike. And if you have to start showing that reconciliation, companies may decide to move to GAAP over time. The one thing I'd maybe add, again, from a comp committee perspective here, is you know let's think about what is the goal of compensation plans. Right, the compensation plans is to incent and motivate management to do the right thing by by the shareholders from both short-term and long-term perspective. And so you want to make sure that the plans are that they're clearly connected with kind of the set of operational decisions uh, that management can make. And and often the operational decisions are are better tied to non-GAAP 
uh, then they decide to, to head to gap. Um, it's just it's just easy for management to see the cause and effect uh, of what they're doing. And so uh, I, I see I understand what Terry is saying, but kind of from a behavioral perspective, um, I think non gaps going to be around for a while. Yeah. Great. And I think we have time for just one more question. Um, so uh, more towards the future, what areas of compensation do you think proxy advisors will consider in the future? Uh, you want me to go with that one, Reiner? I, I'll give you my two cents. Yeah, please. I, I think you're going to start to see um, um, uh, more of an effort around disclosure um, around non-executives. So we've already started to see some of this manifest itself through the CEO pay ratio, and there's been a lot of energy around disclosure of broader workforce statistics. And so to the extent that companies become required to disclose that, I could see that as a natural thing that the proxy advisors would begin to benchmark, understand, evaluate, and um, ultimately recommend um, uh, in company, for companies that have to do it. Yeah, yeah, and maybe just two other things, again, from an operational perspective. You know, one is, uh, uh, you know, people have Section 16 officers, and that's, of course, the ones that are the focus, but there's a lot of other high-paying, high-paid, maybe some of the higher-paid uh, people in the companies that are not Section 16, and that that, that uh, may be interesting. And then secondly, I can also see some things around uh, looking at pay in the context of, of diversity. Obviously, this idea of of having diversity is very important at the board level, and a lot of people are focusing on that issue, and that also, of course, is important to make sure that uh, progress there also is reflected in the way in which people are paid, and I, I could imagine it's a bit more long-term, but some focus in that area as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you both. That's all, unfortunately all the time that we have for today, um, but thank you, Reiner and Terry, for uh, sharing your insights with us. So with that, I'll turn it back to Sienna.